reinvent yourself during a crisis. I'm Margaret Stella, Programs Research, Research and Publications Manager with AIA Baltimore. This afternoon's presentation is part of a series with our Practice Management and Allied Professionals Committee in response to COVID-19 issues and to offer timely business and practice resources for firms of all types and sizes. I'd like to introduce the presenter, Vernon Brocky. Uh, he is a business strategist with over 30 years experience in sales, management, and entrepreneurship. Currently a strategic advisor with the Brocky Group, Vernon has been a partner and owner in companies like Alternate Tax Solutions, VTR Services, Jackson Hewitt Tax, with over 13 locations um, and more than 300 employees and City Publications and Growth Coach Chesapeake. Vernon won numerous sales and management awards working for IT companies like Stratacom, Redline, ROLM, and who now operate under Cisco, Juniper, and IBM. Vernon served on the CCBC Foundation Board Treasurer until 2019. Vernon's four children attended Loyola Baker Blakefield and Seton Cough. He currently lives in Catonsville, Maryland with his wife, and he is on our Allied Professional Committee um, and for this presentation, please be sure to add your questions to the chat box. And if you need CEU credits, please fill out the form um, that Kathleen just put into the chat box. After the presentation and Q&A, we'll break out into uh, breakout rooms uh, with Zoom and each, and we'll have let the conversation go further there. The session is being recorded and the presentation slides will be shared with all participants. With that, I'd like to hand things over to Vernon and thank you for leading the discussion. Great. Well, thank you very, very much, Margaret and uh, Kathleen. Look forward to this uh, <coughs> presentation. So many of us are in a situation where we're trying to understand where are we today. And one of the things that uh, we don't, we can't stop what's going on. We can't stop the waves, but we can, you can uh, learn to surf. And that's uh, what we're all doing, I guess, daily and hour by hour, right? Trying to figure all this out. One of the things that we're looking at as part of the recovery and bounce back, or what are the stages? Uh, stage one, you know, fear and panic was probably around the uh, March, early, uh, mid, mid of March. I think it was March 15th is when everything started to shut down and we're not going to be able to go out for a long time. We're not going to be able to open our businesses. And then it extended and it went a little bit further, probably mm -hmm. into April. Hello? Hi, do you want to share your screen? Oh, it's not shared yet. Okay. I was... Sorry. No worries. Huh. Okay, I thought I had already shared it. All right. Uh, come on. Why isn't that sharing? We did it before, you were saying it, right? Hmm. That's odd. You see it at all? Mm -mm. Sure. Oh, okay. I know why. There you go. Sorry, folks. <clears throat> So stage, uh, stage one is fear and panic, probably March, April timeframe. Uh, some people might still be in that kind of uh, environment where, or the stage thinking that, hey, when is this ever gonna end? When are we gonna be able to get our business back to normal? Um, stage two is you know, feeling ready to do something. Maybe we're in that stage. Stage three, I think a lot of us are starting to think when it, you know, we, we're ready to do something and let's take actions to go do it. And then how do I get our business back on track? And then how do we get ready for the bounce back recovery? So one of the things we wanted to do is to actually have a, um, a, a, a poll right now that, uh, that Margaret's going to offer to see where, where people think they are, which which area that, uh, which stage are we in for this, the uh, current situation? You want to uh, launch that? I am, um, Zoom said I'm logged in from another device. Kathleen, would you mind activating the poll, please? All the technolog technological issues this afternoon.
I only got two of them, huh? All right, we got it out. Good, stage two. Did you get all five questions in? I did. Um, if you're able to see the polls options, there was two that I had created. One was the draft and then the final was the other one. So you can share them. We go back and put the other, the other poll in if you can. Okay, maybe I can do that. Can I do that? Yeah. There we go. Sorry for the mix up there. We'll get, we'll get it together. Survey says, oh good. It's a close race here. All right, we've got that another 10 seconds and then we'll close the poll. Great. So it looks like uh, what action should you take and getting your, uh, actually all three of the last ones, how do you get ready for the bounce back recovery and ready to get going? That's great. Great, thanks for uh, taking the poll there. So what I'm about to do is kind of go into some of the things that we can, uh, you know, what we need to look at. But one of the key things is you have to decide ultimately whether you, it's a glass half full or if it's a glass half empty. Uh, and then taking action to that. So this is a, a quote by Warren Buffett, only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. So um, all, those, uh, all those things that we look at that we might have been wanting to do for a long time, like work from uh, work, have a balance of home life and work life, being able to work from your own home office, um, you know, a lot of organizations weren't ready to do that. Well, they were forced to do it and they actually found out that productivity can be either equal or better and you get the better home uh, and, and uh, uh, balance of uh, life and, and work together. So a lot of things are exposed and a lot of times companies, organizations can look at is, am I, are we doing the right things for what we want to do as we go forward? So before, you know, getting back and restarting uh, or engaging in the, in the bounce back, what we want to answer is uh, when your home is damaged in a disaster, a big question would be, would you build the same, would you rebuild the same home or would you uh, build a new one, your dream home, or maybe you take different parts of it and you create a, a, something else that's better than what you had. The same can be said for looking at your business. Uh, <clears throat> the COVID-19 crisis may still be pummeling your business, but there will come a time when the, the storm starts to ebb, ebb. And that's when you have a unique opportunity without the forces of inertia pushing you in the direction you've always gone. You have a moment to decide where you want to be. It's an opportunity to uh, rethink how you approach your company, to rebuild your business into what you've always dreamed it could be before you get uh, the little decisions come in that uh, are stacked on each other and then you can't, you, you're kind of stuck with the, um, I'm trying to get this around there, right? Uh, <clears throat> with the uh, areas where you can't undo them because the winds of, the winds of um, the forces of nature have taken you in a direction that you, you were going as compared to maybe where you want to go and maybe uh, re repurpose what you're doing. Many, most businesses evolve over time into a patchwork of products and services. Might be multiple services that you uh, provide for a, a mishmash of customers. 
that's per perfectly normal, but there may be only some products and services that truly add value to your organization. And what you want to do is be able to understand what they are so you can you know, build that company that you really want to build. So the seven questions you want, the seven essential questions you want to ask before is it all starts with the problem your company is uniquely uh, set up to solve. So what is that problem? Who is most affected by the problem? Defining who your ideal customer is for the problem. How does your company solve the problem? How does your organization solve that? Then describing what makes you different, what makes you, uh, what gives you an enduring competitive advantage or an unfair advantage over your, your competition or, or organizations that you work against and provide for. What does, what does it look like when you solve the problem? After you've identified it, you've, you know what you can do, and then what does it look like afterward? What's the end result? In other words, how will people know when, you're, when you've solved your problem? What is your mission? What quantitative objective yardsticks will you use to know when your mission is accomplished? And lastly, how will you make money? What's your business model? So what we're going to go into now is eight examples of transitioning and uncertainty. This is uh, Stephanie Breedlove. In 1992, 10 million Americans were out of work. We've seen, you know, these kinds of situations before. The country faced record deficits and poverty and welfare rolls were growing. Family incomes were losing ground to inflation. Jobs were being created at the slowest rate since the Great Dep Depression. That's when Stephanie started a payroll company and rather compete with the big providers like ADP and others, she decided to focus on providing payroll for parents who had a nanny. It was a tiny slice of the payroll market. 20 years afterwards, she sold the company for over $20 million. So she was focusing on doing the one thing as compared to doing many things. Here's an example of after 2011, uh, Sonny Vanderbeck, um, a lot of Americans thought, uh, believe they were at war, the crisis paralyzed owners who wondered who, you know, what would become of the world. Spending stopped, the stock, the stock market tanked. At that time, Sonny Vanderbeck owned and operated a web hosting company called Data Return and had just seen a billion dollar acquisition offer from Compaq go up in smoke. He'd actually sold, had an agreement to sell the company and September 11th came and the, and the acquisition went away. He, he, he uh, understood that that was the situation, and, but his company was burning cash. So they figured they had six months to get the a deal done before they would face mortal danger where they go out of business completely. He found a buyer and unfortunately he uh, sold it. He sold it to a company that actually was doing a roll up and soon after the transaction closed, Sonny Vanderbick realized he had made a mistake uh, because what happened is they had overbought many companies and they, they went bankrupt themselves. So he had a dollar, a billion dollar acquisition go up in smoke in just days. And then he owned a company that was worth nothing. What he did is he, he that didn't stop him though. What happened is he believed in himself and he believed in his company. He went back and, and bought the assets and uh, a few years later sold the company for $30 million. Uh, actually, so he got it up to 30 million and sold it for 85 to uh, Terramark worldwide. So he, what he did was basically bought at the bottom. Uh, in 2003, Joshua Dick, uh, the year, you know, it was a bad year again, 19, uh, 2003, a lot of us forget the, that, that time, but it, you know, jobless recovery. The year began with concerns about the war in Iraq. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell below 8,000, if you can believe that. Um, mortgage rates uh, plunged to a 30-year low. Homeowners rushed to refinance. They cut taxes. Uh, Joshua took over his father's company, uh, and the company Ernex was generating less than a million dollars in annual sales across seven product lines. 
He retrenched and jettisoned six of the seven product lines to focus his limited resources on um, the one product that Dick had uh, thought had the potential to scale. Believe this or not, cleaning supplies for commercial coffee makers. In other words, a niche of a niche. He poured all his limited resources into becoming the best one at it in the world and ultimately grew his company and was able to sell this company as well. So he was, uh, he was strategically pruning his organization with different products or services that were no longer necessary. <clears throat> the, um, <clears throat> John Moore during the Great Depression of 2008, which we probably all remember, was a time of massive disruption. Stock markets around the world were dropping hundreds of points a day. Banks were failing. Many, including John Moore, thought the end of the world was coming. Uh, he was the founder of 3D4 Medical, a company that created three-dimensional models of the human body, photographed them, and licensed the images to textbook publishers. When the recession hit Ireland, Moore's business took a significant turn for the worst, and he realized he had needed to reinvent the company. He decided to offer an application that students could use to learn about anatomy. Instead of focusing exclusively on textbook publishing, they started selling their application, their app, during, uh, directly to students, teachers, and medical professionals. The business began to hum, and as more universities, including the likes of Stanford and, and Cambridge, signed on, by, 19, by 2019, 3D Medical was up to 75 employees, including a, a reliable management team. So Moore was making plans to grow the business when one of the biggest textbook publishers came in and made him an offer for his company. So, but he was uh, considered, a di considered a digital product as compared to just staying with the product that you have. This is a, a, a interesting uh, story to leverage uh, social networks with $100 uh, investment in, in an organization, but it shows you the power of thinking outside the box and trying to understand what you're doing today when, and what you should be looking at doing down the road. So in, um, Griffin Thaw uh, has, was finishing his final years at San Diego State University and trying to figure out what to do with his life. He spent the last of his saving on a graduation trip to Costa Rica, where he crossed paths with two bracelet artisans named Jorge and Joaquin who were living in poverty. Jorge and Joaquin made beautiful, colorful, handmade bracelets that seemed to capture the essence of their journey. Thal took the last few hundred dollars in his bank account and asked the artisans to make 400 bracelets. Upon returning to San Diego, Thal got to work selling their bracelets. They built a simple website, took orders online. With no money they advertised, Thal promoted his lifestyle brand on social media. Over the next nine years, they built Pura Vida into a $68 million company, who now employ over 1,000 people. And uh, they, they uh, actually sold 75% of their Pura Vida bracelets to Vera Bradley. Some people might know about that. So what they did is took something that, wasn't, you know, that was simple and made it uh, leverage the uh, social networks to grow their business. So the, uh, in 2012, business life was uh, restarting the Great Recession, after the Great Recession, what four years later got into an, another uh, restart, right? The Federal Reserve was using quantitative, quantitative easing to try and kick the start the economy, which was still suffering. Unemployment rate was about 9%. It was against the backdrop that Alter Solomon co-founded an IT services co company called Flux7. Solomon and his partner started as two smart guys with laptops and would take any project. Partners quickly realized they needed to focus and become best in the world at one thing. They decided on becoming expert and helping companies migrate their technology to Amazon Web Services. This focus created a domino effect where the more they concentrated their marketing, the more they attracted customers interested in AWS. They were able to say no quickly to the wrong fit customers reserving their sales resources for people who wanted to leverage AWS. They also found the focus accelerated their referrals, which in turn fueled their growth. 
By 2019, Flux 7 had 70 employees and was acquired by NTT, a Fortune 500 giant. So they narrowed the hourglass in creating a focus on the product itself. Uh, the beginning of the end, invest in yourself. In 2012, Scott Moore lost his job in restructuring. Moore decided to turn his crisis into an opportunity by starting a restaurant with his friend in Jacksonville, Florida. They called it the Maple Street Biscuit Company and offered what they referred to as a comfort food with a modern twist. Moore invested a chunk of his life savings in the first re restaurant and it was a success. The second store worked well, then a third. And emboldened by their early results, Moore wrote a business plan for massive expansion, which called for 25 locations across the southeastern U U.S. in 18 months. To fund the growth, he put his house up as collateral on a bank loan, personally signed for the guarantee. Had Moore failed, it would have left him penniless. As it turns out, the, the, uh, pay, the, the gamble paid off, and uh, his, the Maple Street Bakery Company was bought by Cracker Barrel in 2019, so things can happen very quickly. Um, in 2000, so the, the, again, back there, so le leverage, um, invest in yourself. Leverage virtual. Uh, 2017, Canadian Danielle Simpson found herself living with her new partner in Berlin, Germany. Stuck at home with little in the way of social network in Germany, Sim Simpson decided to teach English as a second language. Her partner noticed her struggling to compete feedback reports about the students. Most of the students' report cards were similar, yet she had to waste hours of retyping identical messages. Uh, Kyle, a, so a software engineer, uh, saw the process ripe automa for automation and built a little tool that allows teachers to select from a list of pre-scripted student feedback options and accelerate the process by providing comments about students. Colin Simpson uh, reasoned the tool might help each other in English and offered it on a subscription basis. So they offered a subscription uh, on a monthly basis. Two years later, the company accrested $50,000 per month in recurring revenue when they decided to um, offer their business in a life ex for a life changing transaction for the couple. So they were able to leverage the social groups. So the eight ways just to summarize, do, do one thing, buy at the bottom, strategically prune, consider a digital product, leverage your social networks, narrow the hourglass, invest in yourself, and leverage virtual groups. So each one of these uh, areas you can look at and decide, you know, what are the things that I look at in my, in my organization today and what can I take advantage of or what do I see? If there are organizations out, you know, the buy at the bottom, maybe there's organizations that, that maybe you could partner with or actually acquire to be able to provide services that you don't offer today that could advance what you're looking to provide and provide complementary services. Or maybe there's services that you're offering that really aren't that uh, uh, profitable or um, uh, giving for your clients to be able to get uh, better value for you and separate you. So take a look at those different areas and we're going to actually break into breakout rooms and talk about that. The last thing is that this is a uh, what we call the scalability trifecta exercise. So in order for organizations to be able to grow, they need to be able to scale. It can't be done by, by one person or one organization, one person within the organization. You know, if you can have products and services that are teachable, valuable, and repeatable, you're able to, to get more out of the, the, the uh, organization and get more um, profitable as well as more scalable, allow you to actually, you know, rebound, but also be able to balance the, uh, the, the work uh, as well as your personal life. So we're gonna take questions and answers afterwards, but if anybody is interested, we have a ebook that I can send you. And if you're interested, you could uh, put in the chat bar that you um, come in and then we will send you the, the uh, ebook.
And I think what we're looking to do now is to go into um, the breakout rooms, right? Sorry, I was muted. I thought we would do uh, question and answers first, and then we could use that to kind of fuel the discussion in the breakout rooms. Yeah, that's great. So if you put your questions in the chat box, I'll read them to Vernon and we'll help get this going. This is happy hour. I got my beer now. <laughs> Drinking from a water bottle that looks very similar. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It's almost almost a uh, almost happy hour. All right, I've made note of the people who've requested the ebook. If you want to, um, if there's any questions, put them in the chat box, and we can start with that. Here we go. Um, what is the best way to strategically prune without offending existing clients? Uh, that's a good question. I think what you might want to do is to try to look at what uh, are there other organizations that provide the service that you provide that you want to prune and introduce, uh, maybe partner with them to be able to provide a solution for your existing clients to be able to use the other firm to provide a solution or you grandfather it. You would grandfather it and support them till a period of time that you would potentially, uh, you know, just disband it all together. That's a good question though. As a reminder, don't forget to fill out the form in the chat box for your continuing education. How does buy low apply to architectural practice? Yeah, I was thinking again, if um, you were looking at if there was an organization that was struggling and they were uh, potentially looking to um, transition from their current or maybe they're in such a bad situation that they have to close, then maybe you could go in and work with them to uh, provide a uh, merger and acquisition potential. Or maybe there, maybe there's individuals that do individual work that could potentially join your team. So you're getting their, their um, services at a lower price than what normally would be when demand is high and supply is low. And it may not, it may not apply. I mean, that's, you know, it really depends on the organization and the timing. Any other questions before we move over to the breakout rooms? Oh, could you share the several steps again? Yeah, sure. That would be good to have um, before we go to the, the breakout room. And in the rooms, um, 
whoever wants to volunteer as conversation leader, we're going to randomize it and we have a good uh, number of, of you all to break out. Yeah, let me find it quicker. But the seven, what are the questions we have in the breakout room though? But that's, that's the eight essentials, aren't, isn't it? I believe that was what you said, yes. If you would uh, give those again so that people can address them in the breakout room. Okay, I'm sorry, I got the, let me find it here. That's what the questions we had when we broke it up to what are the top three? Is that what the question was in for the breakout room, Stella? I mean, Margaret? Yes. Um, the top three things that we're seeing right now that companies and firms in both the, uh, in the AEC industry are seeing. Um, and someone has asked to share that or explain the hourglass again. So the hourglass was uh, basically, it's kind of a, a, a offshoot of pruning, but focusing on and, and focusing on one thing. So the hourglass itself was the uh, jet, the company that so he they they. Um, didn't do a lot. They didn't do services for everybody. And what they did is focused it on specifically for um, Amazon Web Service. So they weren't everything to everybody. They were looking specifically to leverage Amazon and not building everything to, to do it. So they were more on their own to be able to uh, focus on the one area. And then also asked, how does one start a digital company? Or can you explain that uh, step further? Well, if you have knowledge, skills, and experience, you can create different um, opportunities for organizations to understand from you how you can work that. But you can also offer services that would um, that would be able to be on a subscription basis. That maybe you create a program. Uh, I think somebody was telling me that one of the organizations has a, a weekly or a monthly program where you can go in and get training. So you could start to do training and then have a subscription based kind of a monthly fee for the, the services that you're, uh, or the training that you're gonna offer, whether it be in um, you know, maybe BIM or uh, CAD or you know, other types of um, uh, architectural or engineering kind of uh, services that you might wanna create a, uh, a marketplace for with a subscription base that they could offer on a monthly basis. It could be a newsletter that you're gonna offer. And then maybe a, a discussion room, there's membership, uh, you know, membership that you could offer that will allow for uh, discussion on a monthly basis where you all get together, all the folks get together and you know, be able, much like what AIA does, but in a more concentrated area for the digital uh, service that you're offering. Good question, Bill. And before we head to the breakout rooms, Vernon, do you want to give any instruction or last questions for consideration? Yeah, I would just say, you know, maybe start off on, you know, where, where, what, you know, what do you think, which stage you're in, and then, you know, where you think that you could either prune or what areas you could add to your existing kind of offering, not specifically, but, you know, in general. All righty. 
All right, so we have 16, 17 participants, and I'm going to break us into rooms of um, groups of five or six, so we'll have three rooms. And it'll be at random, um, and we'll have about 15 minutes for, for the breakouts. Okay, so it'll, if you haven't done this before, it shuffles everybody around. Um, here we go. And then we'll come back. <laughs> yeah, and then we'll come back at the end. Yes, exactly.
I guess we're back. So you have a lot of black and white, Paul? Uh, yes, uh, actually. Um, this is from a historic do um, hmm. site or something. But um, huh. I've got a book from, um, gosh, who was the guy in Baltimore? Black and whites, black and white photos. I it's not Ansel. Not Ansel. Oh, Aubrey, Aubrey. Aubrey. That's A. a. Aubrey Bodine. What a great book. If you could create a book like that, Paul, you're off to the races, buddy. <laughs> what I do you think? like uh, W. Eugene Smith's style and trying to photograph like that. Uh, a. What is the fellow's name? A. Aubrey, A U B R E Y, Bodine, right? B O D I N E. Look it up. He's a Baltimore guy. A lot of Baltimore photos. One of my favorites. Maryland guy anyway. Baltimore, That's Annapolis. Good. Yeah, yeah. Maryland. Yeah. Maryland stuff. One of my favorites of his. My my aunt's a, um, a nun, and she's at uh, uh, Notre Dame College, and she used to wear the black and white, you know, nun. Uh, outfit yeah. and they she had he has one with nuns that are in black and white and it has a black umbrella and it's raining so it's all black and all white it's just really cool well we're back yeah i just googled the aubrey bodine and a lot popped up yeah yeah that, that's a that's a new name for me too. I, I, that's interesting. Really? Well, can't know everything. <laughs> Come on, Ruth. You know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do after teaching, or if I'm going to keep teaching. So, not in any rush to decide. And create a teaching course. Well, it's after when you've done something for a really long time, you do wish you had some way to uh, capture it, to share it, instead of just not let it all yeah, sure. disappear, <laughs> dis dissipate, <laughs> go up in smoke. Yep. Okay, we're, is everybody back? How many people we got? Yep, everybody is back. How, how many do you have, Margaret? Um, it says 18, which we were around that when we began. Really? I, I, how do you see all of them? Do you see them all? Sure. Great. Any other um, any um, comments back from the rooms? We created a partnership with uh, Mimi and Ruth and Paul. <laughs> Great. Uh, and I was in the breakout room three. They shared a lot of great information. Um, and I think we we're headed towards a direction where we we're going to be sharing uh, best pra practices. So. Oh, good. And uh, Paula's got something to send my way. When's the uh, happy hour begin? <laughs> the digital happy Anytime. hour? Anytime. Anytime. There you go. Great. So our group um, with uh, Tim and uh, Stacy and Todd, uh, we talked about um, first kind of approaches to uh, market sector um, in terms of what to prune and what to add. Um, there were different, different business approaches that, that everyone's practices re represented from focus on um, 
specific sectors, specific industry types, project types, to a more, more general approach. And um, both of those are, are really good and they're, they're both valid approaches to take. Um, you know, taking on a new sector, um, like government at this time, you know, is something, uh, one of the sectors that's on the rise um, versus just being open to, to anything and being open to um, being flexible and nimble enough to, to take on any project type is also a great approach. And we shifted our conversation um, to uh, just what, what's shifting, what's changing, what kinds of adaptations are people making and seeing just in their regular business practices. Um, you know, everything from going very uh, paperless right now, having to be digital and um, how that's working well in some ways with things like, um, but some of the challenges with having everyone not in the office as far as um, not having as much ability for um, mentorship and um, bringing, you know, really onboarding new, new employees. Well, that's a challenge. Great. Any, any final thoughts? We good? Yeah, there we go. Great. Great, so we're good. What do you think, Margaret? Yeah, yeah. if we want to open it up to a larger conversation with everyone here, we can do that. Um, up to, up to, up to you. Well, I, I just wanted to comment. I think the most helpful, a couple of the most helpful things I heard, one is really putting it into the historical context, which, with, which is what Vernon did, like looking at other recessions and I, other crisis points. I think that's very helpful psychologically just to, to realize, even though this is completely different, because it's health based and it our personal health is under threat but to put it in the context of all these other times when there's been extreme uh, economic change that's hit the architectural profession it's just it's just really good to reflect on that for a few minutes i find it very helpful psychologically and i also liked so that was one thing. And the second thing I really like is the idea of focusing, whether it's pruning, uh, not trying to be all things to all people, the hourglass, once I understood that. So I think that was really helpful, the idea of going for just one aspect in your business. And I guess it applies to me because I'm thinking about maybe transitioning to consulting. But anyway, those were two things that I'm taking away from this that were very helpful. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You know, it's funny you say that. My, um, my son lives in Chicago and he just bought a house. They just moved from San Francisco to Chicago with their second child. And he's like, I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm like, when I came out in 1979, interest rates were 18%, yeah. you know, for buying a house, the, you know, the, uh, the market, the, the, and it, it, but every few years we get these kind of things that go on that look, are, you know, going to disrupt us, but we will get through it. We'll get through it. Somehow we'll get through it. How long it takes, we don't know, you know, but, you know, uh, you, know you never thought, you know, interest rates, unemployment was like 10%, you know, it was just like, crazy i mean it's it's terrible now but we'll get through it and things could bounce back pretty quickly the thing is are we ready and can we what do we want to build do we want to build the house that we had or we want to build a new house do we want to put a new addition on do we want to 
you know, uh, take the garage out and put the, you know, three car garage or whatever, you know. So it's good, to, good, good uh, perspective there, Ruth. I appreciate that. I think it can bring us that because it, it wasn't that long ago that 2008, 2012, you know. You're right about the health aspect, but hopefully they'll find something quick and we'll be able to keep going. Yeah. Um, I've, uh, this is, I, I found his website and it's flipping through here, uh, all these different images. And I can tell that uh, this is A. Audrey Bodine and uh, my uh, oral surgeon in Annapolis had uh, one of his pictures on, uh -huh. on the wall in front of me. <laughs> so I've seen his stuff before. Yeah. So Paul was uh, looking at maybe transitioning to do some other historical things. And I saw his background picture of the steel mill there. And I, uh, it reminded me of A. Aubrey Bodine. I don't know if you folks know who he was, but he's got these phenomenal black and white photo and, yeah. a, and a great website. So he Large was very large format. He, he takes photography in a, I guess he worked for the sun. So he, he was quite, uh, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've also worked in historic preservation architecture too. Hmm. Uh, in on the Manchester project in Pittsburgh yeah. uh, for the re, with the redevelopment authority and Pittsburgh history and landmarks. I was a construction specialist in that case. Uh -huh. That was in 79 and we also had a neighborhood um, or a, a federal program we were working with um, section 312 for subsidized interest. Mm. So, um, so folks in that neighborhood were paying 6%. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But wow, that's, uh, that was a bargain, right? <laughs> it was, yeah. For, for sure. Well, great. I'm available as a resource if anybody wants to reach out and ask any questions or I can help in any way, let me know. I'm a business strategist, so I work with organizations to help them grow and save money. Well, thank you so much, Vernon. Um, just adding to, to what Ruth said, just to reflecting on how all of the disciplines, you know, represented here certainly by everyone who's participating, um, are all problem solvers. I mean, architects, engineers, contractors, um, landscape architects, uh, everyone involved in our in our industry, um, really know how to to, to solve problems and, and make um, positive improvements uh, through the the built environment, and so. Certainly, there's um, ways to, to reinvent ourselves and find opportunity um, as, as part of that, the, the problems uh, solving that, that we need to address in terms of um, health issues, environmental issues, uh, equity and, and justice issues. Um, so everyone here can be, be a part of that. Um, yeah, with, with the new social distancing in offices, uh, there should be some redesign that you, that uh, the industry will be involved in, right? Yeah, there's quite a bit of that. I mean, everything from what landscape architects and designers are doing with yeah. things like designing for distance, um, the program the Neighborhood Design Center took on for redesigning the public realm for accommodating um, drive-by pickups and just more space for people to walk and, and take advantage of outdoor areas, um, right. eliminate cars, be more pedestrian friendly or accommodate cars for, for yeah. drive drive through things like that. Um, to you know a lot a lot of the things that the designers are doing to retrofit buildings to healthcare facilities temporarily, um, making personal protective equipment. Um, there's really been a lot so far that that our community has done. It's really great to see. Yep, for sure. Good. Yeah, it's fun to see the innovation that can take place, even though you're forced into it. <laughs> yeah, that's part of the reinvention that you're talking about, how to sort of, 
you know, turn a crisis into an opportunity. Um, yeah, I've been the, on the construction or commercial building side. I've talked to some building commercial uh, brokers, and they're saying that they think 30 to 40 percent of office space will be not utilized or they'll repurpose it or so they think a lot of you know, buildings are going to be done differently and you know work environments because i don't think everybody's going to go back i talked to um, an attorney and they do court through um through zoom rooms he doesn't think that they'll come back for in the court for specific kinds of um, trials or you know uh, litigation uh, he said that they'll never go back. So what happens to the parking garages around them? What happens to the parking lots, the restaurants, all those? What impact does that have? But, you know, there'll there'll be a whole lot of changes that we'll make that uh, will be interesting. Well, I don't know how people are going to make their mor mortgages. I mean, these buildings are leased or sold or renovated on a per square foot basis. And if these square feet aren't being, don't have a return on them. Right. Uh, this is going to be a problem. Uh, yeah. 